I hope you all had time to to listen to Sorry, Wrong Number. It's a really, again, I feel like it's one of these really remarkable pieces of, of art that has been largely forgotten. Um, and there's, there's a lot of reason why uh, radio kind of gets forgotten in the uh, 20th and 21st century. Um, one thing is that uh, that television, when it came on the scene, um, did such a wonderful job of, of getting rid of radio and, um, and people started paying more attention to it and scholars eventually also started paying more attention to television. And so radio scholars are also a bit of a rarity out there. Um, but with podcasting, uh, it seems like there's a way in which um, radio or at least audio drama has received a kind of reboot in this country. Um, and Sorry Wrong Number is probably uh, one of the most um, influential uh, broadcasts out there. Um, but again, unless you're a radio buff, you know, you've probably never heard of it. Whereas even if you're not a film buff, you've probably heard of uh, Citizen Kane. Right. So, um, <clears throat> as I've done previously in the last uh, three meetings, um, or in the last two meetings, I guess, um, talking about the way in which these radio shows kind of uh, self-reference. And that seems to be a kind of quality of not only radio as an early medium, but as I was saying last week, other new media. And one of the simple facts, kind of basic function of the radio is it delivers to the listener the voice, but not the body of the person who's speaking. And in the history of media, there's lots of different examples of this kind of disembodied voice. Um, for example, in opera, the disembodied voices is really um, a well-established tradition and as often in the case of opera, these sorts of voices are uh, usually masculine, they're authoritative and otherworldly. They're divine or demonic or a bit of both. And um, in Don Giovanni, which is sort of my favorite um, kind of disembodied voice, uh, we have the voice of, the, of, of a man that uh, the Don has killed earlier in the opera and he comes back sort of in statue form. So he's not exactly disembodied, but he doesn't have a human body anymore. And he comes back to haunt the Dawn a couple of times. And I just wanted to listen to just a bit of Don Giovanni um, at, at the very end of the opera when the commendatore comes back and he is um, asking Don Giovanni very nicely to join him basically in hell. Uh, so here we go for a little bit of Mozart. <laughs> this opera for the first time, um, I, um, I used to just turn it on to this moment um, just to experience the shiver and the kind of thrill I got from hearing it over and over again. Um, it was really, uh, I really found it sort of an incredible experience, um, you know, like hearing the voice of God, really. Um, um, and this is, as I said, though, it's, it's kind of 
special case of the of the disembodied voice because we do in fact have do in fact have a body on stage, but it's a body that can't deliver the voice because it's an inanimate statue, and yet the voice is still to be imagined coming from it. It's sort of as I said last week about uh, the ventriloquist dummy. Here we have the kind of demonic version of the ventriloquist dummy, um, and again. Uh, as with, as with radio, it's this kind of, we have this object on stage that's giving sounds, but we don't quite understand how it's giving those sounds, right? There's a material object, the voice is coming from that, and that material object, the radio or the statue, takes the place of the human body. And we know it can't be the origin of the voice, but somehow it's broadcasting to that, broadcasting that voice to us from a different place. In the case of radio, the radio station, in the case of the commentatore, it's, you know, he's broadcasting from hell or something like that. And as we've seen over the last couple of weeks, you know, America's golden age of radio is, is fascinated with the technology of radio itself. And it's not merely a kind of narcissistic captivation of its, of its own image and its own abilities. But one of the things that um, old time radio was really interested in doing was kind of um, selling itself or ensuring that its listeners understood and appreciated radio's capacities, uh, what it could do, how it worked, but also the, the dangers of this new medium. Some artists were also very interested in that. Um, for example, in War of the Worlds and Johnny Got His Gun, there are really significant examples of these disembodied voices. War of the Worlds is this metatheatrical tour de force that stages the radio voice over and over again. It's this disembodied masculine voice of authority, but again, a voice of authority that's repeatedly challenged and defeated by the aliens. And and Johnny got his gun, we have this disembodied voice of the protagonist, Johnny, who sort of like our operatic example is kind of otherworldly. He's the live man who's dead, the dead man who's alive. He's this person who's come back to tell us all. And then in radio, other kinds of radio as well, we have this, this disembodied voice articulated over and over and over again. Um, I'm sure that many of you are, are familiar with Orson Welles's sort of less artistically challenging radio show, The Shadow. And here again, we have the disembodied voice as something like the voice of God. I have a little example here of You're a fool for coming in here again. This is the place we picked up that kid that's burning tonight. What do you want to come in here for? This is as good a place as any, ain't it? Hey, telephone for you, Lefty. Telephone? Yeah. Maybe you never heard of it, but it's a great invention. But nobody knows I'm here. Well, somebody knows because they're waiting on the phone for you. It's over there on the wall. Okay. Don't be too long, Lefty. Hello? <laughs> Say, what are you laughing at? Who is this? Lefty, did you ever hear of the shadow? Yeah. Say, what is this? Too bad about young Gordon, isn't it, Lefty? What do you know about that? The shadow knows. Who are you? What do you want? I want justice. Justice for Paul Gordon, Lefty. And I'm going to get it. But you ain't got no evidence. No. Perhaps there are some fingerprints, Lefty. Ah, oh, no. We had gloves on. There couldn't be no fingerprints. Did you have gloves on all the time? Yeah, sure. I did. You're left-handed. Now listen carefully, Lefty. When you were sitting in the front seat of Gordon's car, your gun was in your left hand. Remember? Say, you ain't nobody, I. It's just... Say... How do you know? What did you do with your right hand? My right hand? You took off your right glove, didn't you? Oh, no, I didn't. I didn't. 
no. Gosh, I'm going nuts. And you couldn't see the car that was chasing you because the angle of the rear view mirror was adjusted for the driver and you weren't driving, so... Do you remember what you did? No, no, I didn't. I didn't take it off. Are you sure you didn't reach up with your bare right hand and turn that rear view mirror? Are you sure, Lefty? No, no, I didn't. I didn't. Just play the, the famous opening line then as well from this. <laughs> Who knows what evil lurks in the hearts of men? <laughs> the shadow knows. Bit. Um, and the, the shadow is really one of those great examples also of this kind of um, vigilante figure that was so became so popular in the 1930s and and has has actually become popular again uh, in the big screen these days we have so many and the little screen so many vigilante uh, heroes out there um, because the system uh, does not work as people feel and felt. And so we have these vigilante figures doing what we wish could be done. Um, and also with the shadow, we get that sense of he is really kind of uh, somewhere between good and evil. He's not, he's not really um, a good guy, uh, but he's not a bad guy either. He's something in between. Um, and we have that famous tagline that you know, the shadow is sort of godlike. He, he knows what evil lurks in your heart. He knows you. He sees you. He sees you for who you really are. And, you know, again, in this program, as with War of the Worlds, Wells is really exploiting the, the newness and the strangeness of radio as, this, as a kind of disembodied voice, right? That it titillates us to listen to this and it thrills us to listen to this um, and to sort of be uh, um, excited by this new medium and at the same time kind of afraid of it as well. And as always, with so much of wonderful old radio, the uh, amount of money that you have to pay to get the shadow to switch from, you know, Lamont Cranston playboy around town to the shadow is, is, is very little money that you have to do. It's just merely sort of moving the microphone or maybe, you know, putting your hand over your mouth and speaking like this so that I become the shadow or I'm back to being the monk, right? So it's a very, the other wonderful thing about radio, uh, such a cheap medium. These voices though that I've been talking about and these disembodied voices are all uh, very American. Um, they're all very white, and they've all been masculine so far. We've we've barely heard uh, women's voices so far uh, in this course. Um, we heard um, a little bit Joe's uh, uh, girlfriend, Kareen, in Johnny Got His Gun, who says things like, oh, Joe, and don't worry, my dad is okay that we are fooling around together uh, in his living room, or his mom who says, gee, if I could only cook hamburgers like that guy can, All right? These are the sorts of women's voices we've heard so far. Um, and then we've heard a lot of male voices. But other voices are on the radio at this time. And during this program, we hear those voices. Um, and um, we want to ask sort of what happens when those disembodied voices are broadcast through the radio to the listener. What are those voices like? And Sorry Wrong Number gives us uh, a couple of different answers. Um, one answer is that they become kind of inhuman and monstrous. Um, and they're either completely devoid of feeling 
and sometimes a little bit um, just sort of filled with ennui. Uh, and sometimes they are robotic. And then in another case, they're kind of just overwrought by people. And the reasons why these different voices sound like this have a lot to do with, not surprisingly, uh, things that are going on in the world that surrounds radio at this time. Right, this program is from 1948. Um, and this is post-World War II America, post-World War II New York City. And so there's a lot of things that are going on related to immigration, to uh, new technology, and uh, the experiences that uh, people have had during World War II, uh, both in combat and uh, back home in America. And certain things also that they experience after the war ends. Oh, it could be busy and I'm all alone here in the house. My health is very poor and I've been feeling so nervous all day. Ringing Murray Hill 70093. Hello? Uh, hello? Is Mr. Stevenson hello? there? Hello? Hello? Oh, hello, George. Yes, sir. This is George speaking. Hello? Who's this? What number am I calling, please? I'm here with our client now. He says the coast is clear for tonight. Yes, sir. Where are you now? In a phone booth. So don't worry. Everything's okay. Very well. Now, you know the address. At 11 o'clock, the private patrolman goes around to the bar on 2nd Avenue for a beer. Be sure that all the lights downstairs are on, eh? There should be only one light visible from the street. At 11.15, a train crosses the bridge. It makes a noise in case her window is open and she should scream. Oh, hello. What number is this, please? Okay. I understand. Now make it quick. As little blood as possible, eh? Our client does not wish to make us suffer long. Will a knife be okay, sir? Well, yeah, the knife will be okay. And uh, do you remember the other details? Yeah, yeah, I know. Remove the rings and bracelets and the jewelry in the bureau drawer. That's right. Our client wishes it to look like simple robbery. So don't worry. Everything is going to be okay. All right, then. Be sure to... Oh! Oh! Oh, how awful! Uh, the voices, so one of these voices is sort of um, uh, vaguely foreign, somehow vaguely Eastern European, not exactly sure. Um, the other seems more at home in a, in a sort of New York accent. Um, but they both have a kind of, um, again, a kind of vaguely Eastern sound to them. You know, Our client wishes this to happen and kind of the, 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 there's a lot of glottals and sort of mucus in the throat as they say these words. Um, they're heartless and cruel. Uh, the murder is discussed without any remorse or feeling or anxiety. They're not even worried about it. If you remember just listening to the, uh, the, uh, the shadow, that person who has just committed a crime, speaking with all kinds of emotion, these two men are really sort of bored and a little bit sort of resentful at what the client has asked them to do. They keep saying, yeah, I know, I know. So I'll do this and then I'll do that and I will kill her and if the, and so on and so forth. So it's these sort of sinister Eastern voices that are very heartless and they seem really hardened by experience. One death, one more murder, it just doesn't mean anything in the world. And part of what is being expressed here is uh, some unease about immigration uh, following in the wake of, of World War II. There are about 500,000 new people came to New York in the two decades after World War II. Um, 
You know, it's one of the largest population movements in European history. Millions of Germans fleeing or being expelled from Eastern Europe, hundreds of thousands of Jews, survivors of, of genocide, um, refugees from other Eastern European places where communism was being newly installed, and so on. And so we have a lot of immigration and people moving to New York. And this sort of depiction of the immigrant as a kind of hardened criminal and somebody who's a detriment to American society is, is something we're very familiar with today, this kind of um, uh, depiction of these others who are coming to make us a worse place. And, and the police, though, in this uh, production, they don't fare much better. They don't really seem more, you know, the more human than those people who are coming from out, outside. So when Mrs. Stevenson tries to get the police interested, they try to reason her out of this and saying that you know, New York is a big place that can't possibly cover all the territory and so on. And just play a bit of that for you. I have report that there's going to be a murder without you. Ridiculous. That's ridiculous. Oh. Your call, please. Uh, the police department. Get me the police department, please. Thank you. Bringing the police department. Precinct 43, Sergeant Martin speaking. Uh, police Department, uh, uh, this is Mrs. Stevenson, Mrs. Albert Smythe Stevenson of 53 North Sutton Place. I'm calling up to report a murder. I, I mean, the murder hasn't been committed yet, but I, I, I just overheard plans for it over the telephone, over a wrong number that the operator gave me. I've been trying to trace down the call myself, but everybody is so stupid, and I, I guess in the end you're the only people who could do anything. Yes, ma'am. Well, it, it, it was a perfectly definite murder. I, I heard their plans distinctly. Uh, uh, two men were talking, and they were going to murder some woman at 11.15 tonight. Uh, she lived in a house near a bridge. Are you listening to me? Uh, 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 yes, ma'am. And, and there was a private patrolman on the street. He was going to go around for a beer on 2nd Avenue, and, and, and there was some third man, a, a client, who was uh, paying to have this poor woman murdered. They were going to take her rings and bracelets and, and, and use a knife. Well, it's, it's unnerved me dreadfully, and I'm not well. Uh, I see. And I... Uh, when was all this, ma'am? Oh, well, uh, about eight minutes ago. Oh, uh, then you can do something. You do understand. Uh, what is your name, ma'am? Uh, Mrs. Stevenson, Mrs. Albert Stevenson. And your address? Uh, 53 North Sutton Place. 53 North Sutton Place. That's near a bridge. The, the Queensboro Bridge, you know, and, and, and we have a private patrolman on our street, and, and, and 2nd Avenue... And what was the number you were calling? Murray Hill 70093. But, but that wasn't the number I overheard. I, I mean, Murray Hill 70093 is my husband's office. He's, he's working late tonight, and I was trying to reach him to ask him to come home. I'm an invalid, you know, and uh, it's the maid's night off, and I hate to be alone even though he says I'm perfectly safe as long as I have the telephone right beside my bed. Well, we'll look into it, Mrs. Stevenson. Well, and we'll see if we can check it with the telephone company. But the telephone company said they couldn't check the call if the parties had stopped talking. I've already taken care of that. Oh, you have? Yes. And personally, I feel you ought to do something far more immediate and drastic than just check the call. What good does checking the call do if they stop talking? By the time you track it down, they'll already have committed the murder. Well, we'll take care of it, don't you worry. Well, I'd say the whole thing called for a search, a complete and thorough search of the whole city. Now, I'm very near the bridge, and I'm not far from 2nd Avenue, and I know I'd feel a lot better if, if you sent around a radio car to this neighborhood at once. And what makes you think the murder's going to be committed in your neighborhood, oh, ma'am? Oh, well, I, I don't know. Only the coincidence is so horrible. 
Second Avenue and the uh, uh, patrolman and the bridge? Uh, Second Avenue is a very long street, ma'am. I know and it. And you know how many bridges there are in the city of New York alone. Oh. Not to mention Brooklyn, Staten Island, Queens, and the Bronx. I know. How do you know there isn't some little house out on Staten Island on some little Second Avenue you've never even heard about? Oh. How do you know they're even talking in, about New York at all? But I heard the call in the New York dialing system. Uh, maybe it was a long-distance call you overheard. Oh. And telephones are funny things. Look, lady, why don't you look at it this way? Supposing you hadn't broken in on that telephone call. Supposing you'd got your husband the way you always do. You wouldn't be upset, would you? No, I suppose not. Only it, it, it sounded so inhuman, so cold-blooded. There are a lot of... I want to stop it there. I could go on for a while. It's, it's that last bit of logic is so interesting to me. The policeman is essentially saying, well, imagine that you didn't know what you know, namely that somebody is going to be murdered. Imagine that it's happening somewhere where you can't see. It could be a Staten Island. That's far enough to go, right? If it's happening on Staten Island, you don't have to worry about it. Or maybe it's a completely different state. Maybe it's even international. Who knows? As long as you don't see it, it's not there. That's the kind of logic that's being used uh, by the, the policeman there to sort of get her to stop uh, worrying about this. So it's not just sort of the, the people who've been hardened by war. Uh, crime has also become a, a, a different thing after, after World War II. And one murder more or less just isn't worth crying over. Um, you know, at, at the end of, of World War II, really, New York City was kind of elevated partly by default to being the world's capital. London, Paris, Berlin, Rome, Tokyo, all these places have been bombed or occupied or, or starved into humi humility and, and submission. And New York had not. Um, so it became really this kind of metropolis that we think of it as today. And during the war, the police force had shrunk, of course, because men from the police force went into the armed services some of them did not come back. And you hear in this one exchange, there's also a private patrolman, right? So there's some sort of private hired policeman who's meant to be uh, taking, taking care of her uh, Murray Hill, her sort of posh neighborhood in New York. And the, the rising crime after um, VE Day, there was a huge influx of illegal guns because uh, servicemen returning from, from war brought their, their, um, their arms with them. And then also after VJ Day, again, with all these new people, all of this influx um, of you know, power, money, ability, people into New York, uh, murder increased. The murder rate uh, doubled, basically, uh, to nearly one murder a day. So this is the, the you know, these are the sorts of experiences and world events that make the police and these hardened criminals into the kinds of men they become. But then the women's voices in this broadcast don't come off very well at all either, right? So um, most of the female voices we hear have also been robbed of their humanity the telephone operators, the switchboard operators. All right, here they are. Oh, oh how awful, how unspeakably awful. Oh. Your call, please. Operator, I, I, I've just been cut off. I'm sorry. What number were you calling? Why, it, it was supposed to be Murray Hill 70093, but it wasn't. Some wires must have got crossed. I was cut into a wrong number, and I, I, I've, I've just heard the most dreadful thing. Something about a murder. And, Operator, you'll simply have to retrace that call at once. I beg your pardon. 
May I help you? Oh, I, I know it was the wrong number, and I had no business listening, but these two men, they were cold-blooded fiends, and they were going to murder somebody, some poor innocent woman who was all alone in a house near a bridge, and we've got to stop them. We've got to... What number were you calling, please? Well, that doesn't matter. This was a wrong number, and you dialed it for me, and we've got to find out what it was immediately. What number did you call? Oh, why are you so stupid? Well, what time is it? Do you mean to tell me you can't find out what that number was just now? I'll connect you with the chief operator. Oh, I think it's perfectly shameful. Now, look, look, it was obviously a case of some little slip. And the chief operator is not much better, um, although she's slightly more human. Um, but she doesn't respond at all to uh, Mrs. Stevenson when she says, I just overheard a murder, and she just kind of takes it very nonchalantly matter-of-fact response to it. Um, and these disembodied voices, again, uh, lacking in passion in one way or another, um, the women here have been kind of ex become extensions of these machines. They're like cyborgs or robots. They don't respond in human ways. They're just trying to do their job as efficiently and passionlessly as possible. And they try to speak in ways that are just sort of pure form and they don't respond at all to the content of what Mrs. Stevenson is trying to, trying to tell them. Um, so we've got these voices, masculine and feminine, in this play that are really lacking in passion, as you might expect from kind of a disembodied voice. No body, no body to them and so no passion to them. But then we have Mrs. Stevenson herself. She's the very picture of passion. Her vocal range is amazing. Agnes Moorhead, it's, it's, it's a pyrotechnical display. She's, she's like an aria that she sings from beginning to end, just getting more and more chromatic and melismatic and just uh, really incredible range from, from bottom to top and not even necessarily saying anything, but just emitting sound. And this is where she begins, play this. She begins fairly reasonably. Oh, Operator, I've been dialing Murray Hill 70093 now for the last three quarters of an hour, and the line is always busy. I don't see how it could be busy that long. Will you try it for me, please? I'll be glad to try that number for you. One moment, please. I don't see how it could be busy all this time. It's my husband's office. He's working late tonight, and I'm all alone here in the house. My health is very poor, and I've been feeling so nervous all day. Ringing Murray Hill 70093. So that's where we begin. Uh, with with her, and then by the end of the play, she's become almost inarticulate. Uh, but... I won't let them hear me. I'll be quiet. I'm, I'm in desperate trouble. I'm sorry. I cannot hear you. Please speak louder. I, 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 I don't dare. He, he put it down. He put down the extension phone. He's coming up. He's ah, coming upstairs. Okay, okay, give me the police department. The police department. Give me the police department. One moment, please. I will connect you. I can hear him. Oh, I can hear him. He's coming near. Oh, I know it. Hurry. Hurry. Hurry, please. And she blends into the screaming of the train as it goes by. And we feel, feel and hear her fall to the floor and get stunned. Um, one of the things I always ask my students um, about the 
this play when they've heard it is, is do they feel sorry for Mrs. Stevenson? Do they feel sorry? Do they have empathy for her? It's very interesting, their responses. Um, they're mixed. Um, always somebody, and sometimes it's men, sometimes it's women, um, they sheepishly raise their hand and say, you know, I was kind of glad that she got killed in the end. I found her really annoying. Um, and, and then some other people encouraged by this say, yeah, you know, she really was. Like her voice was so annoying. I really hated it. And everyone else sort of chimes in, kind of snowballs from here and they, they say, yeah, and she's, she's so rude to everybody. And she's so mean and she's so domineering. And you just, she's just, you know, she's too much, right? Um, and I think that in part, the show is encouraging us to see her as this kind of victim, but also a monster. And again, looking at some of the political and social context of, of the years around us, right? So, during the war years, um, female labor in the U.S. increased by over 50%, six, something like six, six and a half million jobs. Okay. Women had positions of power. They were supervisors. They influenced and did men's jobs. The question, of course, was what was to happen to these women after the war ended? when the men came home? Were they expected just to kind of take a back seat again and say, okay, you know, I did this during the war. Now I'm going to put on my um, feminine self again. I'm going to be soft. Uh, I'm not gonna be demanding. I'm not gonna be domineering. I'm not gonna be somebody who uh, tells other people what to do. Mrs. Stevenson is not that kind of person. You can see, she's not the kind of person who's going to uh, be a very soft, kind voice person. Part of that, of course, is, you know, she's, it's a class thing as well with her. She has no, no empathy for people who are below her. In class. Um, you know, all of these people are there to do her bidding while she, like a spider, sort of sits in her web, in her at uh, making people do things for her. So there's that. Um, and then also, again, returning to the idea of, of these voices, these disembodied voices. There are lots of sort of um, feminist theorists and especially people who do film are interested in this notion of the female voice. Uh, one of those people is Kaja Silverman and she, argues that really when, when the um, female voice is separated from, from the body of the woman, right, there's, that there's something really disconcerting about that. Right? With men, they become narrators and godlike voices. And as we've heard in, in the other uh, series that we've listened to, From the Shadow to War of the Worlds and so on, and, and also in opera, these kinds of figures become figures of authority. When we separate the woman's voice from the woman's body, it gets scary. Yeah. Especially with somebody like uh, Agnes Moorhead, who is known for playing kind of traumatized, hysterical, strange, domineering women. Again, I bring up her role long after this as the uh, uh, mother-in-law of poor browbeaten Darren in Bewitched. That's the kind of person she is. So when you take away that body and just give the voice, it becomes even more frightful and more of a threat. Um, I'll close with two images here. Um, as I've said before, this uh, play, this radio play, was turned into a film, and actually Louise Fletcher, 
who wrote the radio play also wrote the screenplay. Right? But uh, unfortunately, uh, Agnes Moorhead did not get the role. So here is the, the role. Somebody's been <laughs> telling me that the whole time I've been I've been messing up and I've been saying 48 because I was thinking of the film is 48 and the the uh, the broadcast is 43. Uh, I'm so sorry about that. <laughs> um, so sorry about that. Here are the pictures though that I wanted to show you. Um, here is Barbara Stanwyck, who is in the. Uh, Let's see, in the film version, there's Barbara Stanwyck. Can you all see Barbara there? Quite lovely. And a lot of the, the sort of publicity shots of her in sort of diaphanous robes reclining on her bed, looking beautiful and alluring. All right, so that's Barbara Stanwyck. Um, and this is, of course, Agnes Moorhead. All right. That's a much more sort of threatening, frightening kind of uh, figure than, than, uh, than beautiful old Barbara. 